What you see here is the glorious scenery one can find in Tibet. Tibet, you may ask, but I've never heard of Tibet. That's not too surprising since the media overall doesn't care much for Tibet, but that's where I come along. To start off, let me tell you about where Tibet is. Here is a map of Tibet. Wait, you may say, that's a map of China, not Tibet. And you'd be right, according to what the Chinese insist. But the true Tibet lies right here, the Tibetan Plateau, which consists of almost one-fourth of what China claims as their own land. How did this come to be? Well, first let's talk about Tibetan life. The Tibetan people are nomadic yak herders and farmers who travel or work with their families year-round. Each person in the family has a significant role, and their living is mainly based on sustenance. As long as their yaks give enough milk, or their crops yield enough food, they are content. Before the Chinese took over, Tibet had been living for centuries under feudal rule, but not quite the kind that we think of in the Western world. Tibetan feudalism consisted of land owned by the state, and farmers who worked the land and paid taxes to the state itself to be used in monasteries, the military, and other similar expenses. And while it sounds similar up to here, the workers actually had rights to the land other than simply leasing it. While they did pay taxes, they could treat the land somewhat as if they were the owners by selling it, leasing it, mortgaging it, or passing it down through heritage. There were some who leased land from aristocrats, but they were also protected from unjust treatment by a law passed by the 13th Dalai Lama stating that tenants had the right to complain about any abuses made by their aristocratic landlords. In Tibet, life revolved greatly around their religion, Tibetan Buddhism. Tibet hadn't modernized past medieval times, but this is simply because the Tibetan people had always been satisfied with their way of life. Tibetan Buddhism is based on the belief that one can reach nirvana by developing their morality and wisdom through meditation. And in order to reach that state, Tibetans are awe-inspiringly devoted to their religion. Here is a perfect example. These women are performing full-body prostrations, a Tibetan form of worship in which one moves their hands together from head to chest and then prostrates themselves on the ground. However, these are not ordinary full-body prostrations because they are taking part in a pilgrimage while only moving distances based on how many full-bodied prostrations they've done. This is a grueling task and is usually done after an important event or in preparation for one, such as the death of a father or an upcoming festival. A common destination for these pilgrimages is the capital of Lhasa, which, depending on the distance, can take anywhere from a few months to several years to reach. Their everyday life is also affected greatly by their religion, as they take time to meditate, pray, or do full body prostrations at home. These here are prayer flags. The five colors of the flag represent the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. Each one has a mantra written on it, and the belief is that if one hangs the prayer flags in a high place, the wind will blow through them and carry the mantras into the universe for all to prosper from them. Similar to this is the act of spitting prayer wheels. A prayer wheel is a round cylinder with mantras written on the inside and outside of it. Prayer wheels work by spinning, and each full rotation in a clockwise direction is the equivalent of reciting the mantra a single time. Many Tibetans will use their free time to spin prayer wheels and recite mantras in order to gain merit and it is not rare to see a man or woman walking down a road on their way to a market reciting a mantra repeatedly. Another aspect of Tibetan Buddhism is the festivals. Before Chinese occupation, Tibet had over 60 festival days every year, each for a historical event, deity, or asking for a good harvest. Their current spiritual leader and former political leader is His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, shown here. The Dalai Lama to Tibetans is like a man-god on earth. He is believed to have reached enlightenment in his first reincarnation, but returned to earth in order to help others reach nirvana. Today, however, the Dalai Lama is no longer in Tibet, but a refugee in India like many other Tibetans. This is because, in 1950, the People's Republic of China invaded Tibet and began what they called a reunification of the motherland. Many Tibetans living in eastern Tibet 
fled to the central regions, and rumor quickly spread of Chinese soldiers performing unspeakable horrors. Previous to this, Tibet had been in perfect peace, despite the fact that the rest of the world was immersed in war. Even with the Chinese civil war next door, Tibet continued its isolated way of life in perfect peace. Due to this, military training was not seen as a necessity, and by the time China invaded, resistance was impossible. So instead of fighting, the 14th Dalai Lama hoped for negotiations with the Chinese, and agreed to send his emissaries to Beijing for the meeting. Unfortunately, the emissaries agreed to the 17-point agreement without the Dalai Lama's consent and effectively gave control of Tibet to China. As Chinese soldiers continued to encroach on Tibetan lands, tension continued to rise, and the situation became more dangerous for the Dalai Lama. In 1959, during the Tibetan uprising, the Dalai Lama was forced to flee to India, denouncing the People's Republic of China and forming a Tibetan government in exile. Naturally, the Tibetan people were not pleased to be placed under communist rule. The two were polar opposites, one pro-religion, the other against. One happy in feudalism, the other demanding total equality. And as time continued, the tension did anything but lessen. Even though the Tibetans were now technically Chinese citizens, they were still treated as inferior in many ways. Social stigmas and government prejudices were made evident time and time again, and many Tibetans, like their beloved leader, fled their homeland in search of refuge. More problems arose, and during Mao Zedong's failed Great Leap Forward, the Tibetans were hard hit, as their problems were ranked lower than everyone else's. After Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping attempted to start a rapprochement with the Tibetans who had been living in exile, hoping that they would return to live in China. He was confident that upon seeing the improved conditions and the conformity of the Tibetan people in China, those living in exile would gladly come back. However, when the exiles visited Tibet, they were greeted like heroes by those who stayed behind, and it was evident that they were not at all happy living under Chinese rule, throwing out all possibility for the return of the exiles. Later, when the new Panchen Lama was announced, the second highest religious leader to the Dalai Lama, he mysteriously disappeared and the Chinese government tried to replace him with their own government-approved Panchen Lama. Not surprisingly, Tibetans refused to acknowledge the replacement as their true Panchen Lama, and continue to search for their own to this day. These are just the major events though, because within the Tibetan plateau, much more happens that hasn't gained as large a profile. Tibetans are treated as second-class citizens and harsh judgely for nearly anything they do. It's normal to hear of a Tibetan getting arrested after police find a picture of the Tibetan flag on his phone. It's also illegal to have a picture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, unless it is from before 1950. Another common occurrence is for Tibetans to have their homes raided without warrant for evidence of contraband. It is also not uncommon for a Tibetan in need of medical assistance to be turned away at a hospital run by Chinese doctors. These breaches of human rights have occurred and been reported countless times, yet still been ignored. So much so, that in desperation for AIDS, protests have gone to extremes. This happened not with riots or destruction of property, because that would be against their religion, but with self-immolations, the most extreme form of protest possible without harming anyone else or their belongings. Since March of 2011, over 100 people have self-immolated to protest Chinese occupation within Tibet, with some happening outside as well. Several prominent figures, including the Dalai Lama, have risen to spread the word of what is happening and seek to help in convincing China to give Tibetans their rights, and yet very little has happened. Why? Because primarily, the United States has little to gain from freeing Tibet, and secondarily, China has a hold in almost every country in the world, especially the more modernized ones like the United States. China is a valuable resource, and it knows that, so the government feels that they can get away with this because they know that there is very little challenge another country could give them without jeopardizing their relationship with them in business and productions. This is also true when looking at their history of human rights abuses with their own people. Their grip on the United States is so potent that when a meeting between President Obama and the Dalai Lama took place, the Dalai Lama had to be escorted from the White House through the back door where garbage bags were left in order to help keep a low profile. While the Dalai Lama has changed his attempts for freedom into attempts to establish an autonomous Tibet region within China, many other Tibetan leaders and Tibetans within and outside of Tibet continue to lead the cause for total freedom in hopes that one day Tibet will no longer be oppressed and will be able to live as its own country.
a country where Tibetans will not only be free, but they will also be able to live with their own culture and tradition as they did a century ago.